afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today we're delighted to have with us Safwan Masri. Professor Masri is Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. In this role, he directs a number of Columbia's initiatives around the world and is responsible for the development of an expanding network of global centers that can be found on every continent. Professor Masri is also currently a senior research scholar at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He previously held faculty appointments at Columbia Business School, Stanford University, and INSEAD, the European Institute of Business Administration in France. He is a scholar on education and contemporary geopolitics and society in the Arab world. His work focuses on understanding the historic post-colonial dynamics around religion, education, society, and politics. Beyond writing on education and current affairs for several publications, he actively contributes to building important educational and developmental institutions. He was founding chairman of King's Academy and Queen Rania Teacher Academy in Jordan. He is a trustee of International College in Beirut and of the Welfare Association in Ramallah. He is a member of the advisory board of the School of Business at the American University in Cairo. His contributions to education and civil society have earned him multiple awards, <coughs> including Columbia's Professor of the Year Award for Scholarship in the Classroom and the American Service Award from the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Today, Professor Mastery will speak to us about his new book, Tunisia, an Arab Anomaly, which examines why Tunisia was the only country to emerge from the Arab Spring as a democracy. And today's talk is co-sponsored by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And with that, join me in welcoming Professor Nasser. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be uh, back here at uh, UC Berkeley campus and to be hosted by, uh, by both centers, the African Studies and the Middle East Studies, and to have uh, what looks like a very diverse group of, uh, of participants. So um, I will speak, and then uh, we'll make sure that we have some time for discussion, because I would love to um, engage in a conversation about some of the things that may interest you and to also learn from, uh, from perspectives. Um, so as you heard uh, in, the, um, in the kind introduction, um, you know, I've had sort of uh, different careers um, at uh, Columbia. You know, most of it uh, has been at Columbia, but the past decade or so has really immersed me um, in the Arab region. I grew up in Jordan, and I went back there to set up some educational institutions and observed firsthand some of the developments uh, before the Arab Spring and certainly um, during the Arab Spring and you know, became fascinated with what uh, happened in Tunisia. And what I'd like to do today is really map out some of the factors that I think, uh, based on the research that I conducted for the book, help explain why Tunisia is the anomaly that it is today. And I'll explain in a second you know, why I think it is an anomaly. And you know, I'll take us back yeah, perhaps a little bit through the um, history uh, of the country and relate it both to Africa um, as well as to the Middle East, uh, North Africa. Um, but, you know, we all probably are familiar with uh, the details of what happened during the Arab Spring, but probably doesn't hurt to uh, highlight uh, a few of the developments. You know, December 14, uh, sorry, December 17, 2010, um, a fruit vendor in the town of Sidi Bouzid in the interior of the country set himself on fire when his... Uh, Cart, uh, which is in fruits, was confiscated by the police. He was humiliated, um, couldn't get the attention of anybody in the mayor's office. Uh, but that set an relation, which was not the first of its kind, uh, reverberated uh, throughout, throughout the country very, very, very quickly. Um, there had been uh, resentments that had been brewing for a while over the authoritarian regime of Zain al Abdi ben Ali, uh, and especially his corruption and kleptocracy. Uh, the fact that we had uh, WikiLeaks 2008-2009 uh, shut down by the government, um, a local alternative Tunis Leaks um, exposes the kleptocracy of uh, Ben Ali. There had been protests in 2008 uh, at the Gafsa phosphate mining um, site, and those were brutally crushed by uh, the Ben Ali regime. So the country was ready, um, if you will, for a revolution. Uh, it was ready to get rid of Ben Ali, and uh, the, uh, civil, um, the civil society, specifically the labor union, the Union General de um, 
acted very, very quickly after the self-immolation of Muhammad Bouazizi, he provided logistical support, and social media played a big role. The long and the short of it is that by January 14, Ben Ali was forced to leave the country. And the army, uh, which had always been very small and apolitical uh, in Tunisia, stood by the protesters. And uh, Rashid Ahmed, the um, general in charge of the army, basically told Ben Ali uh, on his last day that the army was not going to protect him. Um, and there are also stories about his head of security, Ali Sariati, telling him, leave for now, but I promise you you'll be able to come back. Um, so, you know, the, the institutions around uh, Ben Ali were, uh, were not really ready to protect him, and he exited the country. But then, people did not go back and retreat into their homes. They continued to protest, and we had a, a couple of series of protests called the Kasbah protest, Kasbah 1 and Kasbah 2, um, where the protesters, mostly youth, uh, um, demanded that no remnants of the Ben Ali regime continue to be in government um, and uh, that there would be constituent assembly elections later in the year. And uh, there was a council that was formed among political parties um, that protected sort of the revolution and its results. And um, again, uh, what happened is that the, the uh, government changed, uh, the president changed the prime minister, uh, we had a new government that was uh, um, did not have any uh, of the people who had served on the Ben Ali constituent assembly elections took place on October 23rd, 2011. Um, no, you know, there is a plurality but no majority. Uh, the Islamist party in Mahba, which had been um, made illegal, and uh, Rashid Ghan Mushi, its founder, spent 22 years in exile, returns in 2011, leads the party. Uh, it was the plurality, but then a Troika uh, coalition is formed with two other uh, smaller parties that were secular. Uh, they lead the way. 2013, you have some political uncertainties, a couple of political assassinations, uh, and Mahda tries to push forward an Islamist agenda. We again have protesters on the streets, and we have what's called the Bardo sit-ins during the summer of 2013. At the same time, uh, we had the Muslim Brotherhood ousted in a military coup, in a soft coup, if you will, um, in Cairo. And uh, four civil society organizations in uh, Tunisia come together, led by the labor union, UGTT, and basically saved the day. They convinced al uh, to withdraw from government. al Mahba, seeing what had happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, um, also, um, you know, concedes. <coughs> And the technocratic government is brought in to oversee what were then in 2014 uh, really important events. The adoption of a constitution that is unique and the first of its kind in the Arab world um, in many respects, including mostly that it is a secular constitution that insists on the civil secular nature of the state and protects uh, the freedom of conscience through Article 6. So Tunisia becomes the only country in the entire Arab world where, for example, <coughs> atheism is not a crime punishable by law. Interestingly, the 1959 post-independence constitution granted that freedom of conscience, but only in the French version uh, of the constitution. In the Arabic version, it granted freedom of religion. Uh, <laughs> that does its way. Um, two other important events take place later in 2014 fair parliamentary elections, and also uh, presidential elections that bring together um, the Nidat Tunis, the secular party, to power, which then forms a coalition within Mahda. 2016, and Mahda drops Islamism from its mandate and declares itself a party of Muslim Democrats. So, you look at that, and you look at the uh, projection over those years um, since the revolution, and you compare that or against the context of um, a civil war in Libya, a civil war in Syria, in Yemen, humanitarian crises unprecedented uh, since the Second World War, a failed attempt at democratization in Egypt. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is elected democratically, but then acts very undemocratically, and then is ousted in an undemocratic fashion, and we are now back in the throes of a political dictatorship that is arguably more authoritarian um, and draconian than the one that the revolutionaries in 2011 replaced um, in, with, with Mubarak. 
Um, so within that context, you know, one has to be impressed by what has been going on in Tunisia. Not that um, the story is, um, is fully written, and uh, certainly the country is under uh, tremendous stresses economically and uh, from a security perspective, uh, political stability has also not been achieved, but I think you know, the, it's fair to say uh, that it has been a rather successful transition towards democracy. So I became really, as, as many people um, as well, became very curious about what is it about Tunisia and why Tunisia, especially as um, youth, uh, revolutionaries, and otherwise throughout the Arab region were envious of the results that Tunisia, the Tunisians have had and wanted the same kind of results um, in their countries. And my conclusion um, was that what happened in Tunisia was really, in many respects, unique to Tunisia. That the ingredients that had enabled this democratization process um, are not only absent <coughs> in most of the rest of the Arab world, uh, but that the trajectory that Tunisia has been on um, has been an opposite trajectory to one that has been followed in many other countries of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and at uh, the risk of oversimplification, I think you know, there are two sets of factors that help explain Tunisia's uh, transition. Uh, one set is environmental factors, you know, factors that uh, help Tunisia, that um, Tunisia was lucky uh, to have had. Uh, you know, one of them is its geography, you know, the fact that it's a small country on the Mediterranean, uh, away from the center of inter-Arab intrigue and, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the um, uh, the fact that it had always maintained relationships through the Mediterranean with Europe, uh, the fact that it had always been African, um, it was the province of Africa that the Romans uh, created when they uh, defeated the Carthaginians uh, after the you know through the Punic Wars, um, it became Wilayat Africa uh, under the Arab Muslims. Uh, so Tunisia is very proud actually to uh, say that uh, the country lent the name to the continent uh, of Africa. So, you know, its geography played a very big role, the fact that it has had many civilizations and that its borders uh, remained unchanged, more or less, uh, for, many, uh, for many centuries. The only other country that can claim that uh, in, the, in the region is Egypt. So, it had a deep history, uh, civilizationally, and uh, a geography that worked to its advantage. Its demographics helped it quite a bit also. You know, this is a country of 99% Sunnis, so there is no um, sectarianism in the country. There isn't the kind of things that have ripped apart a country like Lebanon, uh, the only other country in the region that one can say is a democracy, although it's a non-functioning democracy, but uh, that has been able to sort of survive and, and, and function in some sorts. Um, a strong national identity, again, um, like Egypt, uh, that is an amalgamation of different identities that uh, came to, um, to form it uh, through the various civilizations. Absence of certain factors also helped it quite a bit. So the uh, fact that it did not have the resource burden of some of the uh, rich Arab countries um, in the Gulf uh, particularly, um, and it was insignificant. So it really did not factor into the Cold War. You know, its geography, its small size, the fact that they didn't have the kind of resources that made other countries uh, important in the Cold War um, and played a big role, for example, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, in a way, uh, Tunisia was protected from all of that, but also the foreign policy of its first president after independence, Habib Bourguiba, ensured that. So it did not get entangled, did not get played um, in, uh, in those, uh, in, 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 in those uh, situations, and it always also maintained a small and a political army. So those were sort of you know, factors that helped it quite a bit. But I argue that the factors that really had agency and made the biggest difference had to do with reform, um, and that that reform did not start with independence. You know, Bourguiba uh, is credited with a lot of the progressive, modern, if you will, from a Western perspective, orientation of the country, and he deserves that credit, but he also deserves tremendous criticism uh, for his authoritarianism and violations of human rights, especially during the last decade of his rule. But what was fascinating to me is that uh, the reform 
movement in Tunisia had started well over a hundred years before Bourguiba came to be president. So there is a reform movement that started in the middle of the 19th century uh, that occurred in parallel and to some extent uh, intersecting with attempts at reform elsewhere in the region, particularly the Mahdan movement um, in Cairo. Uh, and its interaction with some developments that were taking place in Damascus and Beirut, which you know, hopefully we'll have the time to, um, uh, to bring back into focus. But that reform uh, really is along four primary dimensions, um, in my view. The fact that religion had played a far more moderate role in Tunisian society, um, and again, that is not only because of the way that Bergeva dealt with religion post-independence in 1956, um, pulling the rug from under religious institutions, closing down religious endowments, uh, unifying the judiciary, um, but introducing very, very importantly uh, a family status code, the Code Statut Personnel and Majalla Shaksiya, in 1956, within months of the country's independence from French, that gave women more rights than they enjoy today in any <coughs> other Arab country. Okay. So polygamy was, for example, abolished in 1956. Uh, women gained uh, better rights in terms of divorce, repudiation, and so on and so forth. <coughs> they had access to uh, birth control in 1963. Um, in 1973, uh, ab abortion became fully legal um, in Tunisia. And to get those things through, we gave a word with the religious authorities of the country. So there was a moderation of the role of religion in society, which again, the, the path for that had been paved by reformers, which I'll talk about, uh, that started working on these issues back in the 19th century. So you had religion, you had uh, women's rights, uh, but you also had education. And so uh, secular <coughs> education had found its way into Tunisia. The interplay between parallel secular educational institutions and the uh, traditional place of scholarship and education, Zaytuna Mosque, which was built in 734, uh, 200 years before Al-Azhar Mosque, the most important uh, place of Islamic scholarship that's in Cairo, unlike Al-Azhar, which had been stagnant uh, for hundreds of years and became very highly politicized in the 20th century, Zaytuna played a very important role in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, reforming itself and uh, as a result of tensions between traditionalists and reformers within, within the mosque. All of that paved the way for a far more progressive and secular approach to education that Bourguiba implemented upon the country's independence from, from France. So um, that, I argue, is a third component uh, that uh, paved uh, the way for a democratization in that Tunisian students um, throughout Bourguiba's <coughs> tenure, but also during Ben Ali's tenure, when education did suffer uh, and became uh, the standards and the quality of education did go down under Bel Ali for reasons that we could get into if you, if you want. Uh, some of that mandated by international organizations that were looking uh, at metrics that were counterproductive in terms of, you know, that were very productive in terms of showing enrollment figures, uh, perhaps performance on traditional scores of TIMS and PISA and everything <coughs> else that we traditionally look at to judge whether education in a country is good or not. What I argue here is that that's far less important, you know, numeracy and literacy um, is far less important than the values that are taught in education systems, especially when you look at what has been happening elsewhere in the region, including my country of origin, Jordan, uh, over the past 40, 50 years, where a, um, a, an exclusive um, intolerant uh, discourse that is uh, based on a hegemon hegemonic role of religion has really taken over education systems. Um, in Tunisia, as of 1958, every single Tunisian student before graduating <coughs> from high school had to have two years of philosophy. Nowhere else is philosophy taught in curricula in the Arab world. 
So students learn to debate, they learn to question. Darwinism was taught in uh, Tunisian schools. Very importantly, religion, Islam in particular, was taught, unlike in the case of Turkey, where Ataturk in 1923, country becomes independent, 1924, the Turkish education reform uh, law basically abolishes religious education uh, from, uh, from the education systems. Burgeba kept it, um, but kept it to one to two hours a week. And very importantly also, he maintained a bilingual education system. One, to ensure that uh, Tunisian would-be teachers had the space and time to be trained while French teachers continued to be in the country performing uh, the teaching tasks. So in 1961, when there was a military confrontation between the French and the Tunisians, uh, post-independence, in the settlement of that, um, Tunisia, uh, Bourgeba insisted on the continuing presence of French teachers. So you had a bilingual approach necessitated by that, but also that limited the infiltration of religion into the curriculum. You know, today, take a country like Saudi Arabia, a student is exposed to nine hours of religious education a week, another nine hours of Arabic taught through the Quran, and then four to five hours <coughs> of science and math. Um, in Jordan, even science is taught um, through the Quran to some extent. So every single chapter in the third grade science textbook begins with an ayah from the Quran, a verse from the Quran, and ends with a verse from the Quran. Um, so, by insisting on bilingualism, that was a way to protect the, um, uh, the curriculum uh, from that kind of religious infiltration, and it exposed students' uh, philosophy training, exposed students to <coughs> philosophers of the East and the West, and at times philosophy was taught in French, and at other times it was taught in Arabic, uh, and so, you know, there were... Uh, Tensions at times, um, even you know, depending on who was in charge of the education system, who was in charge of government, but the ethos of the education system survived, and it survived Ben Ali. So I argue that education uh, was a third very important component. The fourth uh, very important uh, component or factor was civil society, um, in that uh, Tunisians uh, formed the first. Uh, labor federation in 1926 um, uh, that did not last for very long and it was formed um, as a result of a French Italian labor union having been formed a few years earlier 1919 that refused to admit Tunisian laborers into it um, a, there's a Bach uh, workers um, a demonstration or protest or strike uh, by Tunisians in 1925. The French and the Italians do not support them, so the Tunisians set up their own uh, federation. So there's a long history of this. But in 1946, all the labor unions that existed in Tunisia come together and band together to form the Union Générale Tunisienne de Travail and get the sanction of the highest religious <coughs> authority at the time, Sheikh Fadel Ben Ashur, who becomes honorary president of UGTT. So uh, distancing the union from any uh, perceptions of association with Marxism and uh, ensuring that the union is integrated uh, and accepted societally. Furthermore, Farhat Hashid, the founder of the union, uh, becomes a very important uh, figure in the nationalist movement for independence. It travels with Habib Bourguiba around the world, including the United States, including to San Francisco to address a, um, a labor uh, federation meeting to make the case for Tunisia. They travel to the United Nations, they travel to, um, uh, to New York together. In 1952, a letter that becomes declassified many decades later from the um, the French uh, consul in, uh, um, in Tunisia to the foreign ministry in Paris identifies Farhat Hashid and Habib Bourguiba as the two most dangerous men as far as uh, the French maintaining their control over Tunisia was concerned, but concludes that Farhat Hashid was even more dangerous than Habib Bourguiba. Uh, 
So Farhat Hashad gets assassinated by Le Mans Rouge, a terrorist arm of the French colonies in Tunisia in 1952. Immediately he becomes a national martyr and UGTT becomes inseparable from the nationalist movement for independence. Um, within a couple of decades, it has 150 branches throughout the country, becomes grassroots in terms of its operation, and even during its suppression at times by uh, Bourguiba um, and then by Ben Ali, um, it has credibility at the grassroots level throughout the country. So it then plays a very important role in bringing about the revolution and in protecting the revolution after that. Now, there are no parallels to this anywhere else in the Arab world. If you look at Egypt in particular, uh, please come on in. <laughs> uh, if you look at Egypt in particular, uh, labor union movements had started also at around the same time, early in the 20th century. Um, in, uh, after the Second World War and the departure of the Allied forces from Egypt, uh, economic decline, protests, uh, strikes, Jamal Abdel Nasser, the three officer school of 1952, the um, Muslim Brotherhood as well as the labor unions become thorns in Jamal Abdel Nasser's and his regime's side. Um, of course, you know, he oppresses the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, exiles in prisons, um, and you know, that's, that's, maybe we'll come back to this, and of course Sadat deals with them Differently, he gives them more space in order to counter communist trends and to counter Nasserism and the, the, uh, what had stayed uh, from the Nasser regime. But as far as the neighbor unions, in 1957, uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser brings all the unions under the control of the state. He forms the Egyptian um, Trade Union Federation. The leadership of it is appointed by the state and the um, uh, the, the head of the ETUF becomes <coughs> the Minister of Labor in the Cabinet. And that is, is a situation that continued until 2011 and, and beyond. So during the protests in the 2000s, in the decade leading to the Square and the Egyptian Revolution, the every single time there were protests or strikes or demonstrations, ETUF, the labor union, uh, sided with the government against the demonstrators. So you compare Egypt and Tunisia. In Egypt, what you had since the times of Muhammad Ali in the first half of the 19th century, you had a very, very strong and very large army um, that led Egypt um, into the Levant, to the borders of modern-day Turkey, uh, before the British and the French pushed it back, not to save the Ottomans, but to uh, create a field that stayed open for their own encroachment um, on those regions. The uh, military numbered 150,000 under Jamal Abdel Nasser, uh, became um, very strong also, and then controlled uh, many aspects of the economy, um, especially during the period of nationalization uh, in the 1960s. So the point I'm trying to get to is 2011, in Egypt, you have a very strong hegemonic military. Every single president uh, in Egypt, except for Morsi, who ruled between 2012 and 2013, has been a member of the military. And you had a very weak labor union that is um, controlled by the state. In Tunisia, you had the flip uh, side of that. You had a very small uh, apolitical army that numbered around 40,000. And you had a very strong civil society represented by the, um, by the labor union movement, uh, UGTT. Um, so what I'd like to do is take us back a little bit to some of the history that led to this and then create perhaps some connections with, uh, uh, with what happened now. And I'm going to read a little bit some experts uh, from the book. Uh, so in chapter 7, page 114, uh, I talk about, I, I say, the great mosque of Qairawan commissioned in 670, became famous for producing a legal code that was centuries ahead of its time in terms of granting women rights in matters of marriage and divorce, rights that are still absent in almost all Arab and Muslim majority countries. Though rooted in the lessons of the Quran, the code was influenced by social custom and demand, 
underscoring that Sharia is a human product, far from being absolute or static. Especially in the Maghreb, customary law played a critical role in modeling accepted legal and judicial practice. Polygamy had been common in pre-Islamic societies and was, as it continues to be, conditionally permitted in Islam. A man can marry up to four women, provided that he can treat them equally. But marriage contracts in the city of Kairawan were an exception and included clauses whereby a husband pledged fidelity to his wife. If the husband breached these clauses, such as by taking a second wife or bedding a concubine, the wife had full right to divorce and would be supported by the Islamic judiciary. So widespread was this voluntary practice that the expression a Kairawanese wedding came to imply a monogamous marriage. Two stories, both set in the 8th century, in the 8th century, are said to have been the genesis of the famous contracts of Qayrawan. According to one, the future second Abbasid Khalif, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, had evaded pursuit by the Umayyads by taking refuge in Qayrawan. There he married Alwa, the daughter of a nobleman, who stipulated in their marriage contract that he could not take another wife or a concubine. In another account, the governor of Afriqiya, Yazid ibn Hatem al-Muhallabi, married a noble woman from the Hijaz in the Arabian Peninsula, who had settled in Kairawan. Their marriage contract included a similar clause to Arwa, stipulating monogamy. After many years of marriage, Yazid took a concubine, and his wife took him to court, demanding a divorce. The judge, well known for his righteousness, ruled, uh, ruled in the wife's favor, and the governor was forced to choose between his wife and the concubine. And the reason I, I, I you know, share this uh, excerpt is to highlight the fact that even though I feel that the argument is strongest um, from the middle of the 19th century until um, the present day, there's a history and a context uh, for all of this that dates back to as far back as the founding or the arrival of Islam in, um, um, in, in, uh, in Tunisia. You know, to go back to the beginning and take back a few centuries earlier, let's remember that the indigenous people of Tunisia were Berbers, okay, also known as um, uh, The singular of that is Amazigh. Amazigh, Amazigh has taken on uh, political connotations in the 20th century, especially among minority groups in Algeria that wanted uh, to, that fought for sort of recognition um, by the state. But at the um, risk of um, sort of generalizing, uh, which is something I um, challenge um, in my book about the generalization of what it means to be an Arab. Uh, I am generalizing here, um, but, but underscoring the fact that there are many differences among various Berber um, tribes and, 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 and so on. But uh, be that as it may, um, the uh, Berbers are what the settlers from Tyre in Lebanon, the Phoenicians, found when they arrived, when the Queen Beto, as legend has it, arrived in Carthage and established Carthage um, in the year 600, uh, sorry, 814 before Common Era. Um, Carthage then becomes a, a major um, um, country or, or a major state on the Mediterranean. It competes with uh, Rome. Uh, it fights with Rome uh, through the Three Punic Wars. It's finally destroyed by the Romans and then established uh, by Augustus in 29 before Common Era as the province of Africa from which the Romans ruled uh, the rest of Africa. Okay, And the Romans uh, during Roman times, the economy shifts from a reliance on trade to a reliance on agriculture. Um, and during that time, it becomes known as the granary of Rome, uh, where much of the foodstuffs that uh, Rome um, imported for its entire empire came from Carthage, and the boundaries of Carthage stretched at the time uh, all the way to modern-day Mauritania, dipping deep into modern-day Libya and Algeria. So it became a very, very influential, um, uh, very influential uh, province that produced also very important Christian, Christian personalities, uh, Saints Perpetua and Felicity, Father Tertullian, uh, Saint Cyprian, and very importantly, Saints Augustine of Hippo, who was born in Tagast, which is technically today 
um, within the Algerian borders, but at the time, you know, was part of the Carthaginian uh, province. The Byzantines uh, rule, um, then for 165 years, when Justinian sent an expedition in 533 BCE, and then the, Arabs, the Arab Muslims arrived in the second half of the 7th century. Uh, the entry point is what is now Svetla in modern-day Tunisia. Uh, they established Vilayat Afrika, and they set up the city of Kairawan, and established in it, uh, in the year 670, uh, the um, great mosque of Kairawan, the Uqba Ibn Nafi Mosque, one of the oldest mosques standing today anywhere in the world. Uh, the Mosque of Kairawan, as is typical in Islamic tradition, becomes a place of great scholarship, with builds libraries around it. Um, in uh, no time, it also has a medical school attached to it. Uh, it produces um, great scholarship on Islam, on the Maliki Madhab, but also in the sciences and in medicine, and uh, provides a um, a forum, if you will, for collaborations with non-Muslim, uh, particularly Jewish scholars, um, and produces uh, people like uh, uh, Ibn al-Jazzar and uh, um, Ishaq, uh, the Israeli, you know, great uh, medical scientists of the time. So, when Islam arrives, uh, of course, and uh, it confronts not only a Berber indigenous population, um, but it also confronts traditions that are Berber, that are African, and um, traditions that are Christian, that have been there for a very long time. And so it adapts itself. And it adapts itself by being more forgiving, more um, inclusive, if you will, and allowing certain things that you would not find in the Islam of the East. For example, the worship of saints, which then allows for Sufism to spread. Uh, up to a point that, uh, at one point in the um, Middle Ages, every single village of, or town in modern-day Tunisia had a Sufi temple. And even today, Sufism still, um, still thrives, and then famous towns in Tunisia, like Sidi Bouzid, you know, the uh, birthplace of the Jasmine Revolution, is named after Sidi, which is you know, um, a, a Sufi uh, um, term that's used to uh, revere saints, Sidi Bouzid, uh, Sidi Bousaid, um, and so on and so forth. Kairawan becomes the launch pad also for Islam into sub-Saharan Africa, and so uh, Kairawan, and of course, you know, Fez had a very important role um, in, uh, in Morocco, develop an Islam that is somewhat distinct, you know, from the Islam that they have developed in the eastern provinces, and of course, that was um, affected and impacted and influenced by the rise of the ideology of Ibn Taymiyyah in the late 13th century. Um, and uh, on whose teachings Muhammad Abdul Wahhab had established what we now refer to as Wahhabism, which uh, partnered with the Al Saud clan as far back as 1744, um, and basically became the uh, foundation on which the current or, or the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia was built, and with the discovery of oil was exported uh, throughout the region um, and beyond. Um, so, the development and the evolution of Tunisia from that time was very much impacted by the presence of those civilizations before Islam and by how Islam <coughs> sort of evolved and thrived in the, um, in the province since that time. Now, enter the, um, the Ottomans, right? So, you had the Reconquista and then you had the um, the sort of rivalry uh, between over the Barbary coast, okay, between Habsburg Spain in the west and the Ottoman, Ottoman Turkey in the east. Uh, permanent control of, of, of Tunisia by the Ottomans um, it happens in 1574. But almost right from the beginning, <coughs> Tunisia becomes a semi-autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire. It is ruled from 1710 until 
the Bailical rule, uh, rule is dissolved once the country became a republic in 1956 57 uh, by the Husseinian dynasty, descendants of uh, the Bey Hussein uh, Ben Ali, who established a, an autonomous status for Tunisia. And the Ottomans really didn't care very much for Tunisia at the time. It was not a prized possession of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they allowed that to happen. Now, the Husseini dynasty then produced, in the 19th century, great leaders who interacted very much with the Europeans. So, um, things that <coughs> were happening in uh, Europe at the time, of course, uh, following the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 15, Italian unification, uh, very importantly also the Congress in Aix-la-Chapelle in 1818, which ended piracy, which ended piracy. So by ending piracy, that really ate into uh, the economic revenue streams for the peoples who lived in North Africa, including in Tunisia. Trade then, official trade, became uh, very important. Economic relations started developing between Southern Union, uh, the Southern <coughs> Europe and the Northern <coughs> African coast. And so the end of piracy was also meant to uh, open up the way for European economic hegemony uh, over the Mediterranean, and that indeed happened. So what we see is that in the first half of the 19th century, um, economic migrants coming into, the, uh, into North Africa, settling in places like Tunis on the coast. Uh, they come from Malta, they come from Sicily, they come from Italy, they come from France. Um, you have French settlers that start arriving there, of course, nowhere near the numbers of French settlers that started settling in Algeria after the capture of Algiers in 1830, because uh, with the capture of Algiers, the French declared Algeria a uh, province of France. Okay, so it was a very different kind of occupation. By the end of the Algerian War for Independence in 1962, or leading into that, I should say, uh, there were about a million uh, French colons living in what is today Algeria. Uh, the numbers did escalate and did reach uh, more than 100,000 um, in Tunisia by the turn of the 20th century, but they were of course, you know, it's much smaller in number than in neighboring Algeria. But be that as it may, trade with Europe becomes very important. Economic interests in Tunisia by the French, the British, the Italians, investments, uh, investments in also phosphate mining, the building of infrastructure, um, and uh, that allowed sort of the, <coughs> the uh, transfer of goods and the transfer of mined phosphates and ex export. Uh, to Europe. That brought with it exchange of ideas. And so when the British, after abolishing slavery um, in their domain, uh, Tunisia had been, like many, um, well, Tunis in particular, um, was a market for slave trade between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Ottoman Empire and Europe. The British consul approaches the then Husseini Bey, <coughs> Ahmed Bey, in the early 1840s, and suggests to him that maybe Tunisia wants to do something to curb slave trade. In a series of three decrees, uh, culminating in 1846 with the abolitionism of slavery, Tunisia precedes France by two years in its abolishment of slavery. In 1863, Amos Perry, the American consul in Tunis writes the then Sadok Bey, the um, ruler of Tunisia, asking him for advice on whether abolitionism is a good thing or not. What are the arguments for and against, and why did Tunisia abolish slavery? Now, in 1846, when Ahmed Bey abolished slavery, he sought, of course, the sanction of the religious authorities in Tunisia. Okay? Because slavery is allowed in the Quran, just like polygamy is, but under certain conditions. The argument that he used was that it was impo humanly impossible to satisfy those conditions set forward, set forth by Islam uh, 
that by allowing for slavery, slave owners and slave traders would unwittingly forfeit their place in heaven. So we are doing them a service by abolishing slavery and uh, preventing them from going down that path. And they came behind him, and he abolished slavery. And in 1856, Bourguiba used the same arguments, by the way, about polygamy. Also allowed, but under certain very difficult conditions, to get the religious authorities behind him in abolishing polygamy. But the interesting thing, and, and one of the fun um, tidbits of doing this talk, was looking at the correspondence between Amos Perry and Hussein Basha, who was the secretary and the mayor of Tunis, who wrote back on behalf of Sadat Bey. He didn't use the uh, Islamic argument, because what significance would that be to Abraham Lincoln uh, back here in the United States? He used an economic argument. He used an economic argument distinguishing between the productivity of the paid laborer and the unpaid laborer. And so I'd like to think that little Tunisia, unknown Tunisia, actually had a hand in bringing abolitionism to this country in 1865. Because of the colon presence and the French, Italian, and British interests also, um, provide, granting rights to Christian and Jewish migrants into Tunisia became very important. So in 1857, uh, then Muhammad Bey, so we had Ahmed Bey, Muhammad Bey, Sadat Bey, uh, very, very important influential leaders. Uh, Muhammad Bey introduces a security covenant, Ahd al aman which grants foreign uh, <coughs> residents and citizens of Tunisia, you know, non-Muslim, non uh, citizens and foreign residents, equal rights under the law. So they're not subjected to Sharia court, for example, um, and that they are treated according to their uh, denominational um, sort of um, justice and, and so on. And this was triggered by a tram accident in which a Jewish conductor accidentally kills a young Muslim boy. And then in the altercation with the police afterwards, he is um, convicted of blasphemy and is executed under uh, Sharia law. So security covenant um, gives those rights um, and also gives rights for um, land ownership and so on and so forth. 1861, again, because of British influence, Tunisia introduces a constitution, the first of any Arab or Muslim country. Now let's stop here for a second. The interesting thing about all of these things is that they were influenced, but not mandated by European forces. They were not dictated or written by the European forces. So the author of the Security Covenant is Ahmed ibn Abi Riyaf, okay, a political intellectual leader um, who worked for, uh, for the Bay at the time. The Constitution is written by Khalid bin Tunisi, another political leader. Both of those men also played a very, very big role in establishing uh, the, or, or planting the seeds, I argue, for constitutionalism and for democracy that we then see um, evolve in the, in the country. Khairuddin um, al-Tunisi in particular um, tries to reform al-Zaytuna Mosque, introduces modern subjects into it. Unsatisfied with the level of reform that takes place, he establishes the first secular institution in the empire Middle East, North Africa region, Sadiqi College. Sadiqi College is established in 1875, teaches secular subjects, um, teaches the languages, philosophy, um, courses are taught by Italians, by Frenchmen, and by local um, Tunisians. The, country, the, the, the college is still standing. Um, in, at the time of independence, in the, in the first uh, government after independence, a majority of the ministers who serve in the cabinet are Saudi graduates. At one point, uh, one third of the students at Saudi College are Jewish, Tunisian Jewish um, students. Um, of course, economic um, hegemony, economic encroachment, economic colonization, um, takes place in Tunisia, just as it did in Egypt. In Egypt, of course, the um, conditions are 
you had uh, Muhammad Ali, followed by Khalid Ismail, who wanted to Europeanize Egypt, wanted Europe, wanted Egypt not to be part of Africa, but to become part of Europe, wanted Egypt to be more European um, than Europe, um, are, of course, um, indebted to the French and the British financially in order to modernize the country. Uh, Suez Canal opens in um, 1869, in 1875, the um, Egyptians can no longer carry the debt that they are owed, uh, the French and the British. They give up their 44% share of the canal to the British in 1876. Egypt declares bankruptcy. In 1882, it is ruled by the British. Similarly, in Tunisia, 1869, the, um, the, the debt that is owed to France uh, and Britain grows so high that in 1869, the International Finance Corporation is established, which basically gives the French primarily, but also the British and the Italian interests, um, control over Tunisia. That results in 1881, colonization by the French, and in 1883, the Lamarsa Treaty, which dictates sort of the terms under which the debt was going to be repaid. During that, uh, and I'll finish in a couple of minutes, I see it's 1.30 already, uh, during the uh, colonial period, um, the intellectual reforms that started with Khairuddin at Tunisi with Ahmed ibn Abi Diyaf continued. And while there are tensions between traditionalists and uh, progressives and modernists within Al Zaytuna uh, Mosque, uh, mosque slash university, parallel institutions are set up. So, Al Jami Al Khaldunia, the Alumni Association of Saudi College become parallel routes that offer a secular education while reform is taking place within Al Zaytuna Mosque. As the French build schools for their colons, Franco-Arab schools, the Tunisians resist putting their students in those schools because they don't want them to be second-class citizens. The, Tuni the French want the Tunisians to be educated, but up to a certain point, so that they can serve in the administrative machinery in the country. Right. So, but those tensions uh, were ultimately because of the sophistication of the Tunisian leadership. So you have to remember, in, by the end of the 19th century, you had a Tunisian elite that was well educated, that did not reject everything that was colonial, did not reject everything that was French, had a different relationship with their colonial occupier than, say, the Algerians did, for example, with the French, and used what they could to get out of the French the best that they can, especially in the realm of education. So they utilized the Franco-Arab schools, but more importantly, they reformed the Qutab schools that were associated with Zaytuna Mosque. And they uh, continued to set up secular schools, and they went to France to study at the Sorbonne. So Habib Bourdieba and many of his compatriots um, did that at the time. Anyway, I mean, I think, you know, for, for the sake of uh, wanting to finish on time and, and engage in the conversation, um, I'll end by saying that, one, I could go on forever. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a fascinating, I think, uh, history and set of dynamics, uh, especially when you contrast it with some of what was going on elsewhere in the region. You know, to understand Egypt today, perhaps, and the failure of the experiment with democratization, it's really worthwhile to compare the two countries, not only since the revolution or in the years leading to the revolution, but to go back to Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798 and what that did, um, and the, uh, the, the failed reform movement in the 19th century and the role of al Azhar in all of that, and contrast that with uh, the role of Zaytuna in Tunisia and how it grew. Um, but, you know, suffice it to say that there are, uh, that the ingredients that led to the advancement of the rights of women, to a more enlightened progressive education system, to a very active and powerful civil society, to a far more moderate role of religion and society that even in Nakba, the Islamist party, independent of the Muslim Brotherhood, set up in 1881, um, Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi, his founder, would tell you that he was influenced by Zaytuna. He's a product of Zaytuna. Zaytuna did get reformed. And the director of Zaytuna actually stood by, literally stood by Habib Bourguiba as he announced his code statute personnel. Okay. 
when he abolished polygamy. Um, the only thing the polygamy was not able to do was provide women with equal rights and inheritance. But he found loopholes and gave women uh, more rights. In 1973, <coughs> he was told by he was told by Sheikh and Naifa, this is in the Quran, this is a red line. Now, Beji Qaid Sepsi, the president of Tunisia, has put equal rights and inheritance on the table in this past September, and there's a committee that is most likely going to be drafting a law to be presented uh, to Parliament. This doesn't come out of thin air. Borgeba did not descend you know, from Mars. Uh, there was an environment that enabled all of this to take place and for the evolution to take shape the way that it did. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, we can now open the floor to questions. Um, I'm sure folks have questions out there. Sure, go ahead. It's not really a question, it's a comment. It'll be by time for people to come with hard questions. But I, just, I think you picked a, a, this is really a genius topic, actually. Um, I don't really have any connection to, to the Middle East or the Arabic world, uh, but I'm always interested. But it's hard to be interested in the other, <laughs> the capital other. Uh, and, and, and like, for instance, compared to Lebanon, everybody knows about that, but that's a failure. Well, it's hard to think about failure, especially in relation to the West. So, but picking Tunisia, which is like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a success story in terms of democracy, uh, then, then we can get, we, we can sort of get into it and comparing to, I don't know if the book talks more about, like, you know, compared to uh, that Algeria was when it came up, and then you did mention it. Uh, that sort of, but it gives you a way into all the more difficult cases, which is really nice. Which leaves the only real objection, which is that then all the, the, the proper names, especially when I'm hearing them, but even when I'm reading them too, like they all blend together because I have a good, you know, customized. <laughs> that, that's sort that's sort of that's sort of the next obstacle. Uh, but really, really nice. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question over here. Yeah. So uh, there's way too many fascinating things for me to go into. So I'm um, I'm thinking I work in pardon, former French colony in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so I'm sort of wondering if you could talk a little bit more about if you think uh, La Franca Freight played into either um, the way things sort of progressed in early independent Tunisia, but also more recently with the the, the Jasmine Re Revolution and things like that. And I was sort of interested in your comments about sort of, it seemed to me like there was a Tunisian elite that some of them were, were to some extent, French educated, um, and that there might have been an alignment of interests in some senses between certain Tunisian elites at certain times and certain French um, interests at certain times. Sure. That might have been different than, than would have been in other Francophone African countries. And so I'm interested, what do you think about that? Right, you know, thank you. I mean, and, and I'd love to, you know, hear from you because I'm, I'm you know, there's uh, so much I know about sort of how other African nations developed. I mean, I'd say that uh, um, Senghor and uh, Borgeba had a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. And they, back, they basically formed the um, Franco, uh, Francophone uh, tradition. I mean, you know, it really goes back to the, uh, to the two men when Senegal established its independence. Uh, Senegal's uh, code de statut personnel also is modeled after Tunisia's code de statut personnel. And so there was a uh, lot that went uh, that way. Both Borgheba and then Ben Ali also emphasized economic integration with Africa. Okay, so they joined the Maghreb Union. It took Borgheba, by the way, two or three years to join the League of Arab Nations after independence. He really did not want to join the League of Arab Nations. Okay. And his relationship with Jamal Abdel Nasser was a very acrimonious one. His foreign policy was one decidedly pro-Western. Okay. Um, two, it was non-interventionist. And you know that's part of the reason why he felt comfortable with having a, a small army. The identity that he wanted Tunisians to feel was a Mediterranean identity. Unlike other, and I'll come back to it, I guess, for just a second. The issue of identity and identity politics is very, very interesting to me, um, especially with the failure of Pan-Arabism and the experiment with it in the 1950s, like the statistics, Masterism, Baptism. Uh, the humiliating defeat in the 1967 war should have brought them into it. It's really an enigma to me that there are still remnants of a pan-Arab um, ideology that's in existence. Uh, but Tunisians always had the Mediterranean um, inclination to them. And you know, I say in the book, for example, that Tunisia has been non-Arab and non-Muslim longer than it has been either. Okay? And Tunisians uh, are um, are aware of that, as in Abdi bin Ali and uh, 
uh, Bourguiba were very aware of the multifaceted nature of uh, Tunisian identity. There was a very strong identity. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that Tunisia in the 19th century was a nation waiting to be a state. A nation waiting to be a state. Whereas, for much of the Arab world today, you had states that were looking for nations. Okay? Because states that were, you know, borders that were drawn up by sykes Pico, um, the Balfour Declaration, and, you know, other, um, other attempts at that. So, Tunisia's identity is, I think, um, it is sort of, you know, I have a, uh, there's no point looking for it. Uh, it is Oriental, it's Occidental, right? It's African, it's Arab, it's Muslim, it's Mediterranean, it's all of those things. But I argue that it is, at the end of the day, Tunisian. Okay. Now, Morocco, notice, has made a decision recently that its economy is going to be Africa. Okay, so its dependence is going to be Africa. Um, it's its alliance on sort of building economic uh, relationships. So, um, anyway, I mean, I wish we had more time to go into it and, and, and to hear from you as well. But I think uh, the, the relationship with Sub Saharan, Western Africa, the Francophone, um, the non alignment movement, you know, all of those things play to the foreign policy and the direction that Tunisia took its independence. Yeah. Okay. So first, thank you so much for making me even a prouder Tunisian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my second, my question is, uh, knowing all those details about the close and the far history of Tunisia, where do you see Tunisia in five or ten years? How okay. do you predict the future? Okay. <laughs> so that's great. So you know, being an academic, I, <laughs> uh, you know, we all try not to predict the future and to. So let me actually, in answering your question, there's a part of your question that I did not get to, and that is the um, differences within Tunisia. Um, so the biggest challenge facing Tunisia, I think, which determines its success in the long run, is the schism and dichotomy that exists between the coast and the interior and south of the country. Okay? Um, and that goes back to the 19th century, because through the influence of the Mediterranean and Southern Europe, even before that, I mean, listen, the province of Africa under the Romans extended to the south, east, and west. That um, there were, there are maps, um, in, you know, antique maps that basically show that the borders of the province of Africa were not that different from the modern borders of Tunisia. But to focus on modern history, since the 19th century, uh, the French settled in Tunis. Those who owned lands, agricultural lands, lived in urban centers, right? And they had people cultivate those lands on their behalf. That was true in Algeria. That was true also with Jewish immigration into Palestine in the first half of the 20th century. People focused on the, um, on the, the uh, urban centers. Tunisians, who benefited tremendously from economic trade with Europe and with the, with the rest of the world, lived on the coast, Sahel, and Tunis and so on. The interior of the country, the south of the country, had always been marginalized. And protests there date back 1864. Ben Ghazam, for example, the, 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 the Qasirin uh, uh, protest of 1864, which, by the way, resulted in the annulment of the proposed Majba, the personal tax that was going to be imposed. And that resulted also in the uh, uh, the retrenchment, if you will, you know, from, from the constitution that had been introduced three years, uh, three years earlier. Uh, so that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, if you look at the Ben Ali era, okay, we in the West also did Tunisians a big disservice. The World Bank, the IMF, the United States declared Tunisia an economic miracle in the 1990s, okay, because of its creation of the middle class. And surely, under Ben Ali, until 2008 and the global economic crisis, GDP growth averaged 5%. That's very healthy. That's very healthy. But that was an average of 5%. 80% of that GDP growth, the beneficiaries of 80% or 80% of the beneficiaries were on the coast. Okay? So they did nothing to the interior. Um, and, the, and the same mistakes adopted by the IMF in the 1980s, which led to the bread riots of 1984, are the mistakes that are being um, done now. So 
with the austerity measures that have been introduced, um, you know, there is no sensitivity to the regional differences and to the need for distributive justice in the country and no pressure to build infrastructural development in the inside of the country. So the inside of the country tends to identify more with Algeria, Libya, and with an Arab Muslim identity than the coastal elites of the country. Now, I am very hopeful about uh, Tunisia's future. I think uh, one of the things that gives me great hope is uh, the tenacity of, the peaceful tenacity of Tunisians. I mean, that's very, very important to underscore. Um, people don't own arms in Tunisia. It's one of the most difficult, it's one of the countries where it is most difficult to own um, arms. Uh, there is uh, the potency of civil society, which is a great hope. So over the past couple of months, we've seen civil society, uh, representatives of labor and business interests come together with the government, you know, push back, try to find um, some resolution to the, uh, to the problems. There are reforms taking place to reverse the trends that were introduced under Ben Ali, for example, in the sphere of education. Uh, ben Ali satisfied the needs of the uh, uh, international organizations said earlier, opened up the floodgates to education. So in a period of 20 years, you had a seven-fold increase in university enrollments. Um, he <coughs> abolished the exams, uh, um, the entry exams into high school. Um, you're familiar with the 25% rule yes. also, with the, which meant that to get the BAC, the baccalaureate at the end of your high school education, 25% of your grade, was based on three much easier exams administered during the year. And it was <coughs> to me by the current Minister of Higher Education, uh, well, I shouldn't have attributed to him. <laughs> <laughs> In confidence, it was told to me that this was introduced by uh, Minister Lentisi, I think, at the time in order for Ben Ali's daughter to be able to graduate with the back. Okay. Now, many of these things have been reversed because one of the big problems that you have in Tunisia today is that you have an educated university graduate, sometimes armed with two or three degrees, but is not equipped for the job market. Uh, vocational training, something I forgot to say also. Burgeba, and it's really his minister, Mahmoud Nasadi, Minister of Education, who served for 10 years, who have been a playwright who had been a playwright, okay? And compare that with Jordan, where in 1970, the Minister of Education was Ishaq Khan, who had been one of the founders of the Muslim Brotherhood branch in Jordan. He served from 1970 until 1973, uh, two ministries. He was Minister of <coughs> Religious Affairs, Waqf, and Minister of Education. Then he became President of the University of Jordan. And that was the beginning of the irreversible decline. In Tunisia, under Bourguiba, you had Mas'adi, who was a playwright. And under Ben Ali, for a few years, you had Muhammad Sharfi, who had been a leader of the student communist movement perspective, and then uh, the first president of the Human Rights Council that was established in 1978. So, you know, those things. But, but so many of these things are reversed. 25% has been abolished. Exams have been put back in place. Vocational training has been reintroduced. Uh, under Bourguiba, 50% of students who finished their intermediate education phases uh, were admitted into the lycée and continued on to high school based on the test. The other half went to vocational school. And so there was a better match of students who dropped. Um, I'm very confident about, not very confident, I'm reasonably comfortable about the improvements on security. Um, and, uh, but I think you know, political stability, the economy continue to be big stresses. Mm -hmm. Tunisia, uh, there's no threat of the military taking over. You know, you're not going to have in Tunisia what you have in Egypt. I don't think that you can um, go back in time uh, in Tunisia. So I'm not worried about sort of a, uh, an authoritarian regime coming to power. Um, but I think a lot will depend. This will um, take a while, but I'm confident about the future. But you need more people like you to invest <laughs> in Tunisia and to go back and have it. You have another question. And one behind you. Oh, sure. And I read this um, essay years ago, and it was called The White Lies That Enabled the Tunisian Revolution. And it was about um, sort of the mythology that, that sprang up around Bouazizi with the self-immolation. 
that what about the, 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 the mythology that sprang up around Boazizi, around the self-immolation. And it was about this enterprising cousin of his who injected these little untrue details um, into this narrative about how he was uh, college educated and he couldn't get a job, about the, the slap from the police officer that you know, uh, assaulted his dignity. And in the beginning of the, the talk, you were talking about the unrest in the interior, in the countryside, um, and with the labor unions. And also in the couple years before the, uh, uh, before the revolution happened, you have um, sort of urban youth protesting against the World Information Summit. And you also have like the, um, the legal community that was in uh, protest against the Ben Ali regime too. So the question is, is how important do you think this myth was to sort of unify you know, the different uh, disparate parts of the opposition in order to get everybody you know, out together? Um, that, that's before, really, sorry, before you answer, yeah. maybe we take the sure. other question too so that we can take the yeah. Oh, sure. Um, Thanks for an amazing overview. I studied Tunisian music, Mouf, um, and the question about coast and interior is so profoundly a part of Tunisian um, problems, <laughs> all sorts of problems, including cultural ones, okay. and the choosing of coastal cultural elements, musical, artistic, otherwise, to stand for the nation as well. So that's another uh, thing going back to that. I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the history of Sufism, popular Sufism, and repression of Sufism in the 20th century and maybe how things have changed since the revolution at all. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I'll try. Yeah. Um, so five minutes. Five minutes, that's great. Okay, I can, I can do that. Okay. Um, so how important was the myth? I mean, so, so you are absolutely right, and there, there were other things going on. And did it have to take Muhammad Ba'azizi? Did he have to be slapped by the police officer? Did he have to burn himself for all of this to happen? I don't know but it might have taken something else, okay? So it didn't, I mean, the, um, first of all, the protests in Gapsa in uh, 19, in, in 2008, uh, when, besides the fact that they were brutally oppressed by the Ben Ali regime, there were protests against the labor union, against UGTT, its central command. Ben Ali and Bergeva behind him really tried to suppress the labor union uh, but not totally, because for Bergeva, who was far more sophisticated than Ben Ali, um, the labor union allowed the citizens to practice democracy. You want democracy, you know, there. And actually, that paid off because Tunisians had practiced with procedural democracy. It was not foreign to them. Okay? Uh, ben Ali was able to control central command of the union, but because it had become so grassroots, he was not able to eradicate it. So Central Command came under tremendous pressure in 2008. And um, the, according to UGTT leadership, the reforms that took place within UGTT and its Congress following 2008, and certainly its Congress in December 2011, reformed the labor union. And in 2008, they made a conscious decision to take the next opportunity to bring about change. And they sort of regretted what had happened in 2008. Um, I think the, the global economic crisis of 2008, coupled with what Tunisians, you know, they always knew that Ben Ali was a thief. But when WikiLeaks and Tunis Leaks came out, and they knew the extent of his theft and his wife's theft and kleptocracy, and we now know that they embezzled close to $13 million, um, you know, 21% of uh, private sector profits were siphoned off by him and his immediate plea. So all of these factors, I think, were bound to bring about an eruption. And it so happened that it was Muhammad Bouazizi on December 17. It so happened that his cousin, whoever else, um, you know, sort of images spread, and it so happened, uh, according to one story that I talk about in the book, that the vice president of UGTT acted on the spot and went down. So, you know, we don't know. Uh, but if it wasn't that, I think it would have been something else that would, that would, have, would have brought it about. Um, now, when you talk about the oppression of Sufism, where do you mean? Within Tunisia or elsewhere? In Tunisia, the closing of Sway. All sorts of musical happenings, for sure, being repressed. 
when you mean like an Aggie, you mean? Um, Bourguiba as well, mostly yeah. during Bourguiba actually. Yeah. So I'm not that familiar with that. Uh, I mean, you know, what I'd say about it is that the Sufi tradition, so the Sufi tradition thrived in Tunisia throughout the centuries. There were some who were suspicious of it. Ibn Khaldun, the great philosopher that Tunisia produced, uh, was wary of, uh, of Sufism, and he had uh, written against it. Now, Bourguiba, I don't think he was discriminating against Sufism in particular. Okay, and Bourguiba was not, you know, when Sufism is oppressed in other parts of the Muslim world, it is by the more fanatic um, religious, okay? So Wahhabism, for example, uh, you know, it's not surprising that you have um, the, the, the massacres that happen to Sufis and to Shias and so on. Bourguiba, as far as we can tell, he was agnostic, probably an atheist, right? But Unlike Ataturk, he was not an anti-religionist. He actually pretended to be a religious authority. And he was a religious authority. He knew the Quran inside out. He knew the Hadith inside out. He held his own with the top religious authorities. And there's a story, I'm not quoting it because I could not verify it out myself, but it's believable, that in one conversation with the religious authority who kept throwing back at Bodhiva, the Prophet said this and the Prophet said that, and you know, this is logic behind this and logic behind that. He finally looked at the guy in the, in the eye and said, listen, the prophet did not go to the Sorbonne. I did. Okay, so, <laughs> I wouldn't argue it. But, but, but the point of it, he did not discriminate against one thing or another. He wanted to control religion. So his model of laicite was to bring religion under the control of the state so that he can moderate its role. So he closed down a lot of things. He closed down the madrasas associated with Zaytuna. He closed down the uh, Faculty of Theology at Zaytun and integrated them in the University of Tunis when he founded it in 1961. So I'm sorry I don't have particular, <laughs> uh, in a specific, a more specific answer to your question, but, but uh, that's what that's I think. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for educating us. Thank you. <laughs>